Are you eligible for New Jersey Family Care? Open enrollment begins October 1st. It's time to think about health care in a whole new way. WellCare of New Jersey is here to help your entire well-being, physical, mental, and emotional health. Call today to learn more about Medicaid Managed Care from WellCare, a New Jersey Family Care option. 1-888-453-2534 or visit yourwellcarenewjersey.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 57. Nothing will train you to be a better screenwriter than working on your next screenplay. Mongo Wilder. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. The show is also sponsored by my new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. In it, I discuss how to actually create the film entrepreneur model and how to make money with your film or films and do it again and again so you can actually build a successful career and business. So if you want to pre-order the book, head over to filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. Before we get started, I want to apologize for being late this week because I've been running around crazy at the American film market and I did not have time to get this out on Wednesday, but I rushed back on Friday to get it to you. So today on the show, we have screenwriter Paul Galino, and he's the author of Screenwriting, The Sequence Approach, and The Science of Storytelling, The Neuroscience Behind Storytelling Strategies. Now, as many of you know, I love bringing authors, screenwriting authors, gurus, consultants, and screenwriters onto the show to discuss their methods, to discuss their strategies, because you really don't know where you're going to find that inspiration, that that little that key that unlocks your storytelling process. And in this episode, I speak to Paul about the science of storytelling and, and really get into the weeds a little bit about the neuroscience behind storytelling strategies. And as you guys know, I am a huge fan of neuroscience and how the brain works. And when I found out that it was someone talking about how the brain translates stories and what how you can use that information to tell better stories and to really reach an audience, I had to have Paul on the show. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Paul Galino. I'd like to welcome to the show Paul Galino. How are you doing, my friend? Oh, I'm doing much better now that we've started live. This is great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Thanks for uh, being part of my world. Yeah, I appreciate it. Like I told you when we were off air, I always love bringing different voices and different ideas on the screenwriting process because you just never know what's going to connect with that individual screenwriter out there where they might like one person or they might like the other person or this book really talks to them or that idea really talks to them. So I always love to bring new ideas on. And when I read about your ideas and your approaches, I was like, well, I got to get Paul on the show. So I'm so okay, glad. You, I'm, well, thank you. I'm so glad you're on. So first of all, how did you get started in the business? I was uh, started uh, with a Super 8 camera when I was um, 10 years old. You know, dad's Super 8 camera and mm-hmm. making a movie with our dog, the family dog, and then graduating to Super 8 sound and then mm-hmm. finding out one day that uh, there was a, such a thing as uh, film classes taught at, at universities. And I was like, Really? And I studied with uh, Frank Danielle at uh, Columbia University. And as I said before, he was the, he's, he's had a lot of very successful students. He's a, a, was a unique teacher. Uh, his uh, 
table would include Milos Forman, would be recognizable. David uh, David Lynch was another one. Terrence Malick, um, uh, Mar- uh, Martin Brest uh, was one of his students at the American Film Institute. Uh, wow. He's on top. So there were a lot. He he had he was the founding director of the American Film Institute, and he mm-hmm. brought his pedagogy from Czechoslovakia to uh, the United States through that, and and in turn his pedagogy came from studying American cinema in Czechoslovakia and basically watching movies over and over and over again because you could do that for one price, sitting in the theater, and then applying Western um, dramatic theory to understanding how uh, how movies work. And then uh, uh, his approach to teaching uh, was sort of like um, working with you as a collaborator on your script while uh, smuggling theory in so you have a broader <laughs> picture of how, how, what your choices are, basically, making you aware of what your choices are when you're telling a story. So, um, and, uh, so that, that's how I got my start. After I went to film school with Frank, I um, was doing the thing with writing and uh, I was in New York City, so I was working on stage plays uh, and uh, trying to get things released in front of an audience. And then moved to L.A. in 89 uh, and then um, was able to get an agent and he was able to sell a spec script and, and uh, got that made. I like to say the uh, the screenplay was loosely based on a real story and the movie that resulted was loosely based on my screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, so but I, you... I have that and uh, had another film made a few years later and I've been working as a consultant, working, uh, worked on in, in feature animation uh, on a project that did not get made, but it was a, uh, it was a, a great experience. You know, it was one of these things where they so, spent $30 million on it and then decided, oh, I was the sixth writer out of about eight writing teams on the project. Fair and enough. Those, so when you came to, it, L- so when you came to LA though, it was during the whole spec boom time, isn't it? It was the time where spec spec scripts were like, everybody was making a million here, two million there. I mean, the whole Shane Black, Joe Esterhouse era of, of spec right. scripts was that time, right? Yeah, that was uh, um, the, basically the 80s was the discovery that there's such a thing as writing a screenplay and that you can, um, uh, that that's a viable option and that Hollywood was open to those things. Back you know, then. Been periods- <laughs> Yeah, uh, there were there have been periods when they were open, and then they weren't, and then they were. You know, uh, there was a, a boom in this an interest in screenwriting, or what they called at the time uh, photo play writing back in the 1910s. So you look back there, and you'll find about I believe there's about 60 titles on how to write a photo play, and the public was very interested in this, and there were manuals how to write a photo play, and because they were taking from the outsiders at that time. And then you have this drought for many years because Hollywood became some sort of a closed shop of the film school of that time. And then uh, starting for a variety of reasons in the 70s, things fell apart and it opened up and the new voices were heard. And that's when screenwriting was sort of rediscovered. And then starting in 79, you have Sid Field's book come out and then uh, the boom in screenwriting books, pedagogy and interest in it uh, begins there. And uh, so when I was in film school, there actually, my path is, my frame of reference is very different because there were no manuals at the time. I was learning from some, uh, from a master teacher uh, and there were books on playwriting. Certainly there were plenty of those, but um, it was, it was something being rediscovered at the time. You know, what, how do you put this stuff together? So you you've been teaching for for many years now. So you've had a lot of students. You've seen you've probably read a handful of screenplays, just a handful, uh, in in the course of your of your time teaching. Uh, what is the biggest mistake you see first time screenwriters make? That's, that's in, it's an interesting question because my perspective is a little strange in that I I'll train them initially, so like they're not writing a feature. Nobody hands me a feature script right away and. Mm-hmm. It has to be assess it. They have to go through uh, kind of like etudes. You know how uh, uh, musicians have scales, et cetera. 
Uh, well, we have writing etudes. You know, they're going to exercise different writing muscles, and then they build up to a feature. Um, and then, um, then I'll start working with them on that. So um, the ones I've consulted on where I get a, a full length, uh, are you hearing a hammering it's somewhere? Okay. No, it's okay. Go ahead. It's okay. We got sound engineers, you know, that's, it's, uh, I'll give her to that. Right. Um, the, the ones that I see nowadays, uh, what I tend to notice is that in a way they're overthought, <laughs> like they're so encrusted with all these different, you know, they read a lot of books on it and they want to do it right. And I'll have uh, stories that are promising and then, but I see that they're jamming it into some idea and then they're really proud of the fact that I, okay, I have the second twist here. See, see, I got it here and this is here. And so there's often a departure from between, uh, a conflict between what their story is and how they're executing it. So for example, I was doing a romantic, working with someone working on a romantic comedy uh, recently. And this person had uh, a woman, main character, and she's, going after the, she's with the wrong guy, you know, she's with the wrong guy and the right guy is right out there. So end of the second act, uh, he's got this, uh, all his lost moment or, or dark night of the soul. And that moment consisted of her finding out that the guy that she's with is all wrong for her. He's not only not right for her, but he's stealing and he's cheating. He's, I don't know what, he's probably got, you know, murdering puppies somewhere. It wasn't that bad, but it was mm-hmm. like, she makes this discovery. And why? Because you're supposed to have this happen at the end of the second act. And I, I said, well, wait, wait a minute. She doesn't belong with this guy. So maybe the end of the second act is she gets him. Mm. You know, that's not what the audience wants. But it sounds like from what your material, the worst possibility would be that she winds up with the wrong guy. So the worst thing that could happen is he proposes to her and she accepts it. Now we have a third act tension, which is going to be his... Uh, she going to realize in time before the wedding that mm-hmm. the right guy is right there. You see, the, the landscape is, I, I like to say all, all truth in screenwriting is local. You know, it mm-hmm. depend, always depends. Yes, you could have a desperate moment at the end of the second act, but it depends. It depends on what the terrain of the story is you're working on. And so I've run into that. I don't know how helpful that is. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the thing with, the other thing I noticed that I have to, work with students on is, is dialogue and the mistake that they make. And it's certainly a mistake I made and, and it's a mistake that people starting out make. And I, I can see that it's not about overall feature screenplays. It happens in short films. So I can tell you what they come with um, is what I call Q and a dialogue question and answer dialogue. It's um, <laughs> yeah. a character enters the room and says, how are you today? And the person says, not bad, I didn't sleep much last night. How about you? Well, I slept pretty well, but I, I'm thinking of going to the store. Would you like to go to the store? I think I might go to the store. But you know, that's the, we're one question, one person questions, the other one answers, and it's emotionally neutral. So we uh, work, I work with them on how to overcome that, that problem, how to understand how characters interact and how you can avoid that sort of behavior in your scripts and then make them readable. Um, so that's, uh, that's a, a mistake that I see. And that, that's what people do. They, mm-hmm. It takes a while. Um, I, so. I, I, I realized I, when I was first writing screenplays, I'm, I'm by the, by no stretch a master screenwriter by any stretch, but when I first started writing, I did everything. A lot of the things that you were saying right there, I did because I was, I read so many books and I read right. so much technique that I was like on page this, this has to happen on this line. So I would like jam it in there uh, regardless if it meant it was correct or not correct. And I would literally conform the story around absolutely having to hit this specific point. And I found it. And from my own experience that it is just, uh, it's insecurity, you know, it's an insecurity of not, not feeling comfortable with the craft enough to be able to just let it let me do what I need to do to tell the story. Like, you know, with, with these master screenwriters out there, uh, even master filmmakers that they just take their time and they don't, you know, they don't have to hit certain things. Yes. They're going to hit probably the three act structure or 
something like um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I think has a five act structure, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, those kind of things, they'll hit those points in good time. And as long as it yeah. works within the story, does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, to me, it's because I was trained before a lot of theories came out mm-hmm. other than Aristotle and sure, uh, po- poetics, of course, some other more traditional drama. Um, the, the way I was trained, it's, you look at what's, uh, the function and what Danielle from the very first, meeting uh, first class it's about connection as opposed to expression it's it's it, it when uh, take a step back and ask yourself when you go to a film school when you take a writing class what is it you're actually learning you're not learning how to be creative that's not something that can really be taught that we know of yet mm-hmm. <laughs> and you can create circumstances by which people can maybe be more creative but it's uh, not well understood and uh, you know, it's hard to model with computers to get computers to be creative. So we don't do that. We don't teach you the creative process. Uh, what we do teach you, though, what we have learned a lot about over the last several thousand years is we've learned about audiences. And and we can, if you know that your job is to connect with an audience, we can teach you about audiences. And I don't mean like, a particular demographic. I mean, a general person, a normal human being. How do people respond to material? And so, when you think about how a story is structured, say and that's a term that's used a lot. By structure, I guess I would mean the arrangement of the pieces. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the pieces being the scenes and information. Um, you you can see that strategy. You know, three acts five acts, whatever, as a, as a kind of a subset of the bigger question of how do I grab them and how do I keep them? And how do you grab an audience and how do you keep that audience? And if you know how the tools, if you have the tools to do that, you can use it in a variety of very exciting, interesting ways. And you can pivot between a feature film and a stage play and a series, you know, streaming series, because you know how that's done. You know how to get in people's heads. <laughs> and that's one of the things that fascinates me about this and why uh, I wrote that, that second book with Connie Shears, a psycholo- uh, psychology professor. It's how do films get into people's heads? <laughs> and how can I get, how can you teach people how to get into people's heads and manipulate them? Uh, and, and one of the things I like to do when I'm uh, lecturing is uh, I'll show them like a short film that I like. Uh, uh, like a four minute movie and then I'll stop it like with about 30 seconds left in it and say, sorry, we got to move on. I'm sorry. We, you know, and b- this movie has achieved something. It's got them wondering what's happening next. And when I do that, you hear the groans and I say, what's wrong? I, Hey, I showed you most of the movie. Why do you have to see the rest? You know? Uh, and I, I just showed this, these, images up here and found and it went out into that audience and it worked them over and it manipulated them and now they're pissed because they want to see the end of it and that's like amazing and i love that fact and i love learning how to do that and then teaching people how that can be done um and so when we talk about three-act structure or do you need it or do you not need it the way I, it's about how you uh define acts and if you define them by function What is the function of the act? Well, if the function is to create what we call dramatic tension, which is, will the boy get the girl or the boy get the boy? Let's not genderize this. We can, we're in the modern age, we can, will the LGBTQ person get the one that they like? Yes. Um, Will that person get that person? Okay. That's the question. Okay. And we, if we connect with the character, we are going to be uh, tilted into the future. We're going to be wondering whether they're going to get that person. And then, uh, so you wind up in, in drama, it's called the main dramatic question. Okay. Uh, will, will the person get the other person? Uh, and the question, question has three parts. You pose it, you deliberate, and you answer. You, you don't need more, and you can't have less. And so if you want to do dramatic tension as your main tool for keeping the audience interested in your movie, you don't have a choice. I mean, 
if a character, if the audience is watching something and they don't know why the character is doing what they're doing, then they're not going to be in suspense about whether they're going to get what they want. It's not going to work. So, so therefore, you need to pose that question in the audience's mind. And then the third act is you answer the question. I'm sorry, interrupt. So, no, no. Um because you wrote this book, which is called the Neuroscience of Screenwriting, which is is amazing. It's amazing. I'm, I'm, I love studying neuroscience. It's it, it's a hobby of mine. As crazy as that sounds, I love studying neuroscience. Yeah. And I I, I want to ask you, what is it about the human mind that that example that you shared in in your class when you cut them off? What is it in our brains that is this need? To know what happens, this absolutely because you go on the ride, and a good story, a good movie, a good book will take you down this road. And if someone ruins the ending for, I mean, that's the worst. If you get a spoiler yeah. out, or you ruin the movie for them before they ever get to watch it, or ruin the book, or anything like that, there is anger. There is like pure anger. What is it on a neuro, uh, on a neuroscience level? What are the connections? What are the synapses in your mind that are connected? I mean, is this just programming over thousands and thousands of years, tens of thousands of years of telling stories around the campfire where now we're just, if we don't hear the end of that story, we could die? Because that was the original, <laughs> originally the story was like, there was a tiger who ate the child. And if you go around this <laughs> corner, what corner? What corner? What corner are we to go around? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I can't tell you the corner. And now you're dead. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Is that something? I'm just throwing that out in the, <laughs> out there. What do you well, think? Well, that's, there's, and it, there's one theory which is a little bit experiment. Uh, it hasn't been confirmed yet, so we didn't actually put it in the book. But there's a theory of mirror neurons that uh, Connie talked about, that um, this idea that when you watch somebody eat a chocolate pie, mm. the very same neurons that are happening in their brain, if you like chocolate, you know, are, are firing in yours, so you connect with it in that way. Well, that's advertising. That that's basically advertising. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Um, and uh, and I, by the way, I make a, a great chocolate meringue pie. You know, so I just <laughs> and I have to pick that choice because it's, it's important to me. But um, so, but that's one theory. But it hasn't been confirmed. But the best, the best argument that I've heard about. Okay, why do we read stories? Why do we watch stories? Uh, it's because it's universal. You kind of look for what's the adaptation in evolution? Because in evolution, in human existence in any kind of life form, uh, any activity takes energy and you're going to have to eat or consume things in order to have enough energy to do that thing. Um, and you don't want to waste energy. You could starve, okay? Uh, or it's not efficient. If you could spend your time hunting rather than uh, doing something else, you're wasting your time and you're reducing your chance for, for survival. Well, so why are what it, stories must play some role in survival? Uh, and uh, a good argument comes from, there's a book called The Storytelling Animal by Jonathan Gottschall. And his argument is this, that um, and we, we mentioned in the book, it's um, that it's like learning. It's a learning, it's a way of learning about life without being in danger, that you are, it's a rehearsal for life. And it is a learning thing. You, you like you just said, you tell a story about uh, this tiger that's over there and you don't tell people what's the lesson learned, then it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's frustrating. And this process by which we become involved in the storytelling, um, there's other theories about that. It's, it has to do with how we, in terms of connecting with main characters, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, why do we do this part? Well, uh, it, it, there's a process by which some would argue that um, morals in society are created which is uh, one theory is called blurring that you'll literally you'll blur and become another person. Like the example one uh, the theorist gave was uh, this lady is thinking of killing his neighbor, her neighbor. Okay. And then before she does it, she imagines what it would be like to be that neighbor. And then for a moment, she imagines the pain that she would cause by doing that. And then they're, they're blur, they're, their identities blur. And then she decides as a result, I better not do it because I don't, I don't want them to feel the pain that I would pay to feel. Okay. So that's a theory of how we connect with people. And that's deployed by storytellers. When we tell a story, when we connect with a person on screen, 
we literally lose ourselves. I mean, I know you've had this experience. Of course we have. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, you're watching a movie. I've been in a movie theater where the power went out. You know, like, whoa, where am I? I'm, I'm in a movie theater. It's, it's, it's noon. I thought it was nighttime because the movie, you get lost in it. It's very mag- it's, so- It is such a magical thing. It really, when it's a good story and a good movie or a good book, you're not there. You are in the story. You are, right. everything else just shuts down because we're, we're literally sitting in a dark room for two hours. Looking at yeah. some images flicker and some sound play, it's it's fairly a magical experience uh, in the movie right, theater. But anyway, not, right? And there's this thing called the, the willing suspension of disbelief that you're mm-hmm. willing to to do that. Okay. Well, Gottschall argues that it's not willing. You can't help it. If I start telling a story, okay, there was this ship on the sea, and the sea salt was blowing, and you know the the waves were coming in, and the clouds appeared on the horizon, and there was you're there already. You can't stop feeling those things and hearing and imagining it, what I'm telling you. Is it the equivalent of saying, "Don't think of the pink elephant"? <laughs> it could be. It, it, like, it's um, basically, whatever you do, don't think of a pink elephant yeah. right now. And you're you can't you can't stop it now. Everyone who's listening right now is thinking of a pink elephant. Even I told them, don't think right. about it. So very simple. When you were telling that story, I was already I was already going in my head and connecting to the experiences of when I was on the on on a sea on a boat or when I was on and I could smell the ocean. I, I was already I was already going real quick, and I wasn't even exerting any energy to do it. Yeah, and it it comes naturally to us because it helps us. Uh, another uh, psychologist, um, uh, let me get, I want to make sure I get the name, uh, Keith Oatley, because mm-hmm. um, I referenced this. He, he had, had an article called um, the, the um, Flight Simulator of Life, that stories are the equivalent of a flight simulator. For, for an airline pilot, you're on a flight simulator, so when yeah. you crash, you don't die. A movie you're, you become that other person uh, in the movie, in the story, in the film, in the TV series. And they go through all kinds of danger and they learn lessons. And guess what? You got to learn the lesson that they learned, but you didn't have to die in the end. You, you got to learn it. So even a tragedy where the character doesn't survive, you learn something. You know, you've learned, don't do that. <laughs> now, isn't it interesting because as of this recording, the Joker came out in theaters last week and Ah. it is causing all sorts of commotion. People are walking out of the theater. People are loving the movie. It is, it is a very, um, a film that divert, not diversive. Uh, what's the word? Divisive film. Right. Because, and I haven't seen it yet. I have, I have my tickets because I have, I have kids. I haven't either. I want to see it too. But the, the thing which I bring it up for this conversation is that you are following a villain. You're watching a person go from being maybe a damaged human being into a full blown villain, arguably a psychotic maniac who is arguably one of the you know greatest villains ever created in the scope of movies and possibly uh, in, in comic book lore as well. So people have a problem with that because you're now attaching yourself to a villain in such a deep, dark way that it is bothering people. And, and I can't remember a movie. I mean, Taxi Driver would probably be the closest thing. Like when you watch Taxi Driver, there's a lot of people who just can't, deal with it because you're you're travis brickle i mean you're you're, you're with that i do it you're in there yeah. there is nothing else you can attach yourself to and the filmmaker and the storyteller and the screenwriter they you're you're travis and you're going through it and you're he's he's who he is so f- people that's why films like that have such a diverse uh, a divisive um a feeling yeah. to it and, and in today's world you don't get those kind of films so i'm excited to watch the joker I and mean, he's put out by that a studio be- yeah, that that'll that'll be very interesting. Um, the the usually like there have been successful movies, and one reason, one word I discourage my students from using that's popular is when they talk about the main character is hero. And I understand like the hero's journey; they don't necessarily mean hero. But when you say someone's a hero, you gotta the 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 impression you get, the connotation is oh, someone who's heroic. They do heroic things, and they're strong, and they're attractive, and all that. But um, 
we don't learn from those kinds of people. We learn from people who got problems and, and tra- that transgress and they, they do the wrong thing. But you can still, you can have a, a, a character who's um, a, uh, l- let's say, a man who um, has an affair with a married woman and decides to murder her husband so he can get money. And we'll go with it because, you know, double indemnity, that, that, that works. But there is enough there for us to connect with so that we're okay with going for the ride, even though it was controversial at the time. Yeah. Uh, and there was questions about, I mean, it couldn't get made for a long time. And, and there was this sense that people do learn from movies and therefore we can't have bad people as main characters <laughs> unless they're really punished. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but they wrote and shot an extra sequence in that mm-hmm. movie that they cut out. And that extra sequence was, do you remember the film very clearly at all? I don't, I, it, not very clearly. I saw it years ago, probably film school. Years ago. Okay. Well, the last scene is, uh, spoiler alert, but it doesn't matter. It's still, he'll tell you anyway. If it's, but, over, if it's over 50, 60 years old, it's not a spoiler alert anymore. It's the on not that. a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> right. so I, I can't get sued. It's from statute of, limit, statute of limitations. Exactly. So, so this, um, uh, what happens at the end is he, actually it's wrapped around with a, it begins with a flashback. It begins, actually a flash, it begins in the present and the whole thing is a flashback with the guy narrating. And in the end, he stumbles and falls in the office and that's where it ends. You know, and he's with his buddy who, who suspected him and had to you know, ultimately turn him in. Um, but that was, that's where they ended it. But the next sequence that they didn't shoot involved uh, Fred McMurray's execution. Uh, he goes to the to the electric chair. Wow! And it was an expensive, elaborate sequence, and he's his best friend is sitting in the audience, you know, watching his best friend being put to death for his crime. And they they realized it was a little too much, so they they cut that out. But you could see how conscious they were, making sure that we don't connect with, we we don't uh, learn that it's okay to kill people from this movie. Uh, another picture that I like to cite is uh, one that's made the main character committed statutory rape and is in jail for fighting, uh, fist fighting and people having, you know, assaults. And also, um, uh, he's, he's a lazy bum and doesn't want to do any work. That's uh, one flew of the cuckoo's nest. That's, that's, uh, you know, uh, McMurf- McMurphy. What a and, great movie. Oh, what a great movie. Yeah. But so you've got this flawed character in his own way, and the way his his tragic flaw is a good thing. He has humanity. You know that's how the movies really twist things around. But we, our first impression of him is, and, th- and that's that's something called the primacy effect. First impression. The first time you see him, he's he's whooping it up for joy, and then he's going around trying to talk to people and helping him with play cards. So your first impression is he's a good guy. And then you learn a little bit more about him, and then you find out uh, what the kind of person he is, but, but his behavior is at odds with that. So you, I don't like students to censor themselves from having interesting, flawed characters. Now, the Joker I haven't seen. Uh, the, di- the reason for diverse opinions is um, something else that we talk a little bit about in the book. It just has to do with... Of course, what we bring to movies, and we do bring our life experiences to them. Uh, we mm. <laughs> have, right, and, and so different movies are going to affect people in different ways. And I tell my students, you know, when I, I pick movies that I show that I analyze, that it's, uh, I should pick them for three reasons. One is I feel, I have to feel that they work. Because I can't show you a movie that, why, how it works if I don't think it works. The second is it has to be rich in the, in the craftsmanship. So I can point out different things that, the, the writer and the storytellers are doing that they can learn. Uh, and the third thing I tell them is the luck of the draw. I got to love it. And and that's just me. And then they're out of luck because the guy in the next room, he's going to show a different set of movies. And that just has to do with what resonates with me in particular. Um, and there is a, a concept in constructivist psychology called uh, the schema. A schema is a, um, is a conceptual framework by which we understand the world. It's a shorthand way of understanding things. Uh, you, uh, it kind of borders with object recognition, but it's like constructivist psychology, which plays a role in how we understand movies, and which I think if you understand that, you can have fun. Uh, is the premise of that? The argument is that 
our experience of the world, our experience of life, is not largely knowledge-based. It's um, based on inference because our brains aren't powerful enough to process everything that we're seeing all around us. No, of course, of course. Right. So an example would be if you uh, see a curb on a street, you know, a curb, the first time you're going to look at it, you're going to check it out and when you're two or something and you're going to navigate it. But once you, you store it, it's called, that's called bottom up processing. You see it, it goes up in your brain. Then after that, it becomes top down processing where you see a curb, you compare it to your memory of how curbs work. And then you assume it's like any other curb. So you just walk over it. You don't measure it each time you walk over it. That wouldn't be efficient. So we, uh, take, we have those shortcuts. And what happens is that sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes that curb isn't what we thought it was. It's a different curb. So we stumble, we, we fall. Um, so, um, so when we, that, I will get back to that in a second, how that plays a role in screenwriting. But in terms of how we perceive things, we do bring that top down processing to the world because we've all had slightly different experiences. So that going back to Cuckoo's Nest, there's a scene in which a nurse ratchet the first time she does this group therapy and it's terrible. She's, it's just everybody's at each other's throats and she's sitting there impassively at the end. Okay. And I, I stopped it there and I asked my students, what do you think's going on with her? And I got different reactions. Uh, different it was based on their, their perception. One said that she was um, a sadist and she's happy that they fell apart. Another one said that she felt that this person had regret that they weren't healthier. Another one was, you know, there was a variety of these things. And no one's right. It's just they're bringing their stuff. So the Joker will be an interesting one to look at um, what we identify with. I always, um, I, I, I always tell people that um, from my studies in neuroscience that many of the things that stop us from specifically being like screenwriters or being artists in general is by the associations of things that happened to us in the past where you either associate failure and your brain tells you you're basically the brain needs to keep you in this nice safe box. You're in a safe zone. That safe zone is where you go and you'll only go up to the edge of that safe zone because outside of that zone is unknown and whatever's unknown is potentially deadly because that's our, how our, our, you know, our alligator brain, a reptilian part of our brain works. So that's why yeah. it's so difficult for people to lose weight because their safe zone is being where they're at. Or I can't write a screenplay. I'm just going to do a short first. And then they slowly build up the, the courage to like, I'm going to do a screenplay. And then, and if it's not really good or, or if it's, if someone beats them down and they're not prepared for it, they're like, okay, I'm going to go back. It, it's kind of like you, you're, you're always stepping in and stepping, you're always trying to, you're, we're, we're built to be comfortable in, in a comfort mm -hmm. zone. And I always tell people to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's the only way you grow. That's the only way you get out there and do things. And it's, and that works with writing as well, because I know as well as you do, there's many screenwriters out there who live in their box and they do their box well, and they don't generally jump out of their genre, their, their style. You know, that's why I love people like, you know, Tarantino, who stays within his box, but man, he's jumped into every genre possible uh and just throws his flavor into every genre same thing with kubrick when kubrick was was doing his masterpieces i mean he literally made the definitive film of every genre that he walked into <laughs> right essentially so yeah so I, I was just i wanted to get your opinion in regards to the neuroscience behind that and the and the how it affects us as screenwriters and as creatives well, I'm, cer I'm certainly not a neuroscientist, so I, I won't Fair enough. presume to Fair. go there. I, neither neither but, am I, but from, from educated oh, I, I have several patients I'm going to be operating on later today. Because, you know, everybody's got to make a little money on the side. And you pay <laughs> a lot, i got to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah neuroscience is a nice side hustle. <laughs> yeah. It, oh, and you can do a series with those, man. <laughs> of multiple surgeries for the same issue. No, um, but there, it is true what I've, I've uh, uh, that our two talking about the reptilian brain, our two most basic uh, impulses are hope and fear, emotions mm -hmm. are hope mm -hmm. and fear, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and fear is actually what you're describing, stay in the safe box. Fear is actually stronger than hope. And the, the example that I heard from one uh, psychology professor was um, that uh, if you are in a restaurant 
and you get this, you know, uh, fancy restaurant with a wonderful seafood plate, you know, with all this, all the fixings and everything. And you're about to eat it and you see a roach, cockroach in it. That's it. You're done. Okay. You're not going there. You're not going to touch it. Contrast that. Suppose you're sit down to a meal and it's covered with roaches and you see one, you know, artichoke. <laughs> you're not going to say, yeah, look at that. I got an artichoke out of this. You, you don't, you don't touch it. So that's the example they gave of this hope and fear. Now, something else that's useful that, that we didn't talk about in this book, but uh, it's another thing that I think is useful for when writers work with characters um, is this narrative theory of, of psychological development. Because you're talking about people that stay in the box, Tarantino is different, mm-hmm. that, that the idea is that we, um, up till age, by, by the time we get to age three, we have developed a narrative of our lives. Mm-hmm. And we tend to notice the things that confirm that narrative and ignore the, the facts that don't. And this leads to all kinds of neuroses. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm the one who never was loved, so I'm unlovable. Okay, someone throws himself at you, that's an aberration. That not, doesn't fit, you know. And it's, there was this uh, episode of a senator, I forget his name, a Senate, U.S. senator a few years ago, who was caught having sex with men in bathrooms in Minneapolis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like right. that, yeah. okay, so what, what was his story? Well, he was married and he had kids. And he's, he's a straight man, right? Well, that's the story he tells himself. The fact that he's meeting strange men and having sex with them gets ignored in that narrative. <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know what that is, but that has nothing to do with who I am. What I am is a straight man with a family and all that. And in a way, this this guy's living two different lives. You know, one that he's aware of and one that he's blocked out. I can't speak to him. He's not my patient. I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. But you can see that process happening that it's possible that a guy who's spent 50 years of his life, he's like 60 50 years of his life suppressing some reality and constructed a reality in which he was not gay. If he ever came at age 65 to realization that he was gay, that's 50 years of your life that you're a stranger. It's, de- it's, it's, de- it's devastating. It's exactly. devastating. Yeah. Well, so well, you, let me, you should put that away. So, yeah, let, so, so let me, so let's turn this into something for, uh, for screenwriters in regards to, the, oh, the, yeah, those great, guys, those the screen, screenwriting, the guys. screenwriting guys who's listening. No, because I mean, listen, I could talk neuroscience all day, but the, <laughs> but the concept for, for character development, this is so powerful and such a powerful tool to use as a screenwriter to get into psychology and to get into almost the, the, like just the concept of what we just talked about, adding that, that sub layer, that, 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 yeah. uh, that thing underneath it, the, that underlining thing of like, I have to stay in this safe box. Perfect example, a guy who's been, you know, 50 years saying I'm married, I have kids, but then I go off. I mean, that's, and, and exploring why he did that. That's a story. That's a screenplay or, or the person who has a, a wife and kids and he's an, a serial killer, you know, on the side. And we've seen those kind of movies. Like they, they literally compartmentalize, com, compartmentalize. I can't say the word. You know what I'm saying? Compart- to compart- compartmentalize. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> okay, they're, out there a little bit. Okay. but they but they put their, their worlds in different boxes as almost a defense mechanism. Uh, for themselves. So someone like this, the, the guy you're talking about, this politician, he literally was doing this to protect himself in his mind. Like that's that other story, right. which is his true nature. He couldn't, for whatever reason, the way he was raised, his environment, his his social uh, group or community wouldn't accept that. So he suppressed it. And now it comes out in this very strange way years right. later, because it can't, you can't hold something like that in. It's not Something you can maybe hold it at bay for decades, but eventually it will come out. That is such a powerful right. a character the development tool. The dissonance between the story you tell yourself about yourself and the reality when that collapses, that's huge. And the way you can use it in screenwriting, you know, a lot of people like, I think, you know, creating characters. It's a, it is kind of a mysterious process. People come up with them. Some people are very good at it. Some uh, have more plot driven or that kind of thing. You know, they divide it that way. Stories and characters are more primitive, but usually people try to write a background about their character. Okay, mm-hmm. he was raised this, he did this, and that's useful to, to generate ideas. Um, but the other thing to think about is 
not what they went through, but what do they tell themselves about what they went through? What is it? Because this is really important when you're when you're writing a screenplay, when you're even plotting it out. The character doesn't know what the story's about. They think it's about something completely other than what what you're the journey you're going to put them on. So where is their head? Where is your character thinking things are going to go? What's the narrative that they're telling themselves while you're plotting, while you're God <laughs> doing all kinds of things to their lives? Um, so in that sense, to, to give a little thought to this question when you're thinking about coming up with a character, when you're trying to come up with the specifics of a character, um, what are the uh, what do they what do they think about themselves? What's their image of themselves uh, and their story? Really, their story of themselves. And and we certainly we do exist in a story. You know, we we do that. So and, and, uh, it's, a, and it's a defense mechanism. It's a defense mechanism for our own. You know, just for us to be able to to continue. To, it's a story. Stories are so powerful that we tell ourselves stories just so we can make sense of this insane thing called life. And I think that's one of the powers yeah. of story is it's a way for art in general is a way for us to process just being alive and just generally. So we're always looking for something to just grab onto. And story is such a powerful thing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, let me tell you uh, some practical things for, for your students, to how to apply this. That um, The first lesson of Frank Daniel, I mean, I have it in my notes from the first day of the first class was that your job as a screenwriter is to turn the audience into keen observers of detail. That you are going to give them clues. And when you give them the clues, you do it in such a way that they're going to anticipate where you're going. And once you've got them anticipating where you're going, you got them. And you can do all kinds of things with that. And that idea was formalized. I studied with him in 79 to 82. Okay. In 1985, uh, a theorist named David Bordwell actually took that idea. Now, he didn't get it from Frank Danielle. He did it himself. Uh, he came out with a book called uh, Narration in the Fiction Film. And it was, it was very influential in narratology and the study of narrative in the academic world. And he, he applied um, constructivist psychology to how we comprehend movies. That, in other words, we're not sitting back and just absorbing. We're actively involved in anticipating. And that's how we go through life. I was telling you about why, how we assume things about the world. Well, I can give you clues. I can tell you a simple story now. And, uh, and it's like this. Suppose I, I show you a movie. I, I, uh, you're watching a movie. And in this movie, you have a man. And he goes to a, fl a flower shop. And he gets flowers. And he puts on the, on the flowers, um, happy anniversary. And he gets a box of chocolate. Okay, and he's he goes he's heading home. Meanwhile, his wife gets up, you know, she gets herself all attractive and negligee and all that, and uh, at home, and then she gets out a gun and she puts the gun in the drawer of the nightstand. Okay, so where are we going with it? I just tell you that much. You got a pretty good idea that he's planning to make love and she's planning to make war. Okay. That's how it's going to read. I can pretty much assume that. Now, there may be some people who think, well, I really have no idea what's going to happen. But I think most people are going to say, shit, he's in a lot of trouble. Okay, so then he comes home and presents her with the flowers and chocolate. She reaches for the drawer, opens it up, and says, happy anniversary. And it turns out he's a gun collector. And this is the gun that he's been hoping for, and she's been saving for a year to get him this gun, Okay. We have a twist. We just I just told two stories, the one you thought you were seeing and the one you're actually seeing, right? That's all a twist is. But I rely on giving you clues and assuming that the audience is going to put them together. Now, then I, it, then she takes a piece of chocolate. She gets sick and dies. And then it turns out he poisons the chocolate. Okay? <laughs> There's another twist. Beautiful. I give you that information. I just I decide what information to give you and what to withhold. And, and that's one of the things that, that Danielle mentioned. He said there's really three questions when you're developing a story. When you're in the ideation stage and you're trying to figure it out on the outline stage of beat sheet, um, the three questions are, of course, what does the main character want? What are they trying to avoid? Okay. The second is, what does the main character know? And what does the main character not know? And the third is, what does the audience know? And what does the audience not know? And based on those three things, that's going to determine how your story plays and a, a story can be uh this it's it's a difference between the 
story and the telling of the story, uh, or in narratology terms, terms, the narrative, which is the story, and the narration, which is the telling of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, another example I could give you, uh, there's this, there's this um, man, he's at the doctor, right? And he tells the doctor, uh, I'm really worried about my, my wife. I think she's getting hard of hearing. Okay. Um, and doc, but I'm afraid to bring it up with her because she's concerned about, you know, maybe she'd be offended. Um, she's getting older and all that sensitive to it. Doctor says, very simple. Go home tonight, get a certain distance away, talk to her in your normal voice and keep getting gradually closer until she can hear you. Right. And then you'll know if there's really a problem because if there's no problem, you'll know. So he goes home and she's over in the kitchen and he's in the living room. You know, the door is open. And he's sitting on the couch and he just says in his normal voice, um, darling, what's for dinner? Nothing. Okay. So he gets up and he goes to the edge of the kitchen where the door is open. He says, normal voice, darling, what's for dinner? Nothing. So then he goes into the, right into the kitchen, darling, what's for dinner? Nothing. So finally he gets right behind her and says, darling, what's for dinner? She says, for the fourth time, chicken. <laughs> so, it's like, all right, the story was a man is hard of hearing, but he thinks it's his wife who's hard of hearing. The doctor tells him to go home and do this test. He does the test and then discovers that it's actually he's the one who's hard of hearing. If I tell it that way, you're not going to go. It's not going to go anywhere. Right. But if I withhold certain information, I tell you the same story, but it, it plays differently. So that's one of the uh, elements of, of constructivist psychology you can play with. Um, and it's um, it's uh, it's useful to realize too that audiences don't when they go to a movie they don't see a story they see scenes mm-hmm. they see the scenes and they construct the story based on the clues you give them in the scene that's all they ever see on scenes what? they create the story in their minds and knowing that you you realize you have this power. That you can manipulate. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, the 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 master of this of suspense, of course, is Mr. Hitchcock, which uh, and I, when as you were saying the story, I was thinking of Psycho, which was a perfect example of that. He played on the audience knowledge of Janet Lee as a big movie star, and they right. thought and they went down this road with her, and they're like, well, she's. I mean, obviously, she's the movie star. Nothing is going to happen to her. And 20 minutes right. in, she's gone. You know, sorry, right. spoiler, spoiler alert, guys. She gets killed in the spoiler, shower scene. Six years old. Yeah, <laughs> she gets killed in the shower scene. So now the audience has nobody to hold on to. And now they're handed over to this weird dude at the hotel, at the motel. And now he becomes the main character in the middle, which was completely revolutionary at the time. Yeah. And, and, you know, Wes Craven did it again with uh, Scream in a smaller way uh, at the beginning of Scream as well. Uh, they, they do that, like just kill off the, the – yeah, but but the thing is that they carried you along. And it was this whole narrative that he – the whole narrative that he was talking about, like the money and she was running and then the cop pulls her over. And it was all BS. It, 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 he was completely <laughs> leading them down the wrong way. I'm like, no, we're just going to kill her. And now it's really about this. That's brilliant storytelling. He played, he played the audience. And I think that's a great – uh, example i'm glad you brought it up it's a great example about uh, i know you had another guest a, a while ago was it carla glacius i think he he said he, he echoed what i what i think is that um if you if you think about rules because you always hear here's the conversation i hear at the film school all the time because <laughs> it's like this somebody we watch a, a student film and it's kind of underwhelming and somebody says not that our fo- our students always have great films obviously that, obviously a while, obviously Paul. Well, it's job in university for god's sake i mean but, come on but, all right. Yeah. So this, somebody will say, eh, well, you know what? They really got to learn the rules of you know, filmmaking, storytelling. And someone else will say, yeah, but you got to break the rules. And then someone else uh, will say, but you got to learn the rules before you break the rules. And then somebody else will say, how about lunch? Let's go to lunch. How about that? You know, it just goes, this conversation never goes anywhere. And, or I'll hear someone say, well, he broke the rules, but Hitch- it was Hitchcock and he could break the rules. What does that mean? That doesn't help you as a writer. Well, if you don't, instead of asking what's the rule, ask what's the effect. See, if you follow the rules, and I've seen students do this, they'll follow every rule and they, they want me to go like this. Hey, congratulations, you followed the rules. But, but rules don't applaud you and they don't pay you. And, and following them means you're a follower. But if you ask what's the effect of my choice, 
storytelling choice on the audience. Then that puts me in the power position. I'm the one deciding the effect. And audiences do applaud and they do pay them. So think about what's the effect of what your choices are. So, for example, with Psycho is a good example uh, of, of a schema. You just mentioned the schema. If you have a major star and audiences are used to seeing major stars in movies and they're used to seeing them all the way through the movie, they may die at the end, but they're used to seeing them all the way through the movie. And the producers who paid money, a lot of money for that star, they want them all the way through the movie to get their money's worth from it. Then that's what the expectation is going to be. Uh, so, uh, and another thing, we talked about how audiences connect to a main character. Well, you use that as a way in a traditional drama, not like an ensemble, but in a drama, like a traditional drama with a single protagonist, uh, that that's where the audience connection is. So you're going to keep them interested because that person's alive. Okay. So you have a lot of powerful things going on. Um, and then, but then if you violate that, if you break that, like, like Hitchcock did, the question isn't, uh, he was bad because he broke a rule. It's how did he get away with that? He didn't have the connection to the main character to sustain audience interest through the movie. So what did he do instead? And what he did, you mentioned. He dwelled, and he did it intentionally. He dwelled for a long time on getting um, the, uh, what's his name, uh, Bates, to cover it up. And he w- he really took a long time. They could have just cut away and it's all cleaned up, but he washed it out, and he's cleaning it up, and he's doing this, and he's bar- putting the body in, in there. And it's now, by that time, we've connected to somebody, and we've connected to a young man who's desperately trying to cover up something his mother did. That's the story. And we're gonna, or we're, we're, is it? Or is it? <laughs> oh, we think that. We, it's hard to see it. What do you know? But you think it. And, of and course. I'll, 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 I'll give you one more example of this, of how, you know, the contrast between following rules and, and going for effect. Okay. Uh, let's say you wanted to write a book uh, about how to tell a knock-knock joke, right? What would you do? You would go around and find every knock-knock joke you could find. And you would come to some general conclusions about it, and you would write the book. And you would say, in order to tell a knock-knock joke, you have to have, you start out by saying knock-knock. The other person will say, who's there? Then you give a partial answer, and then they say partial answer, who, and repeat it back. And then you give the full answer with a twist. And that's how you do it. Those are the rules, okay? So um, let, me, let me try this. Um, knock-knock. Who's there? Control freak. Okay, now here's where you say control freak who. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that was I good. just broke I like that. that. Right, I just broke the rules, but I didn't. What, the effect I wanted was a laugh, not the rules. So That's I relied brilliant. on the schema of knock knock joke to get the effect I wanted, which was the laugh, rather than to simply deliver another knock knock joke. That's so this, great. These are the different. <laughs> That's really great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, but so this is the world that Frank Danielle got me into, which is playing games with the audience um, and ultimately strategizing on how to keep the audience wondering what's going to happen next. And if you can do that, if you know how to do that, uh, you can do anything with them in a feature film, uh, and you can pivot into streaming. You know, you can pivot into. Uh, stage and the one act, ten minute plays. What it, it doesn't matter. You understand what, how to grab them and how to keep them. It, it puts you in a real power position. So we were not taught like um, by page thirty this, by page sixty this, by page ninety this. We weren't really taught that, or we were discouraged from following formula. Actually, the the one formula we were told uh, to follow was stories about exciting people told in an exciting way. You know, if you, if you use that formula, you're asking the right questions. What's an exciting character and what is, uh, how do you tell that story? Like, wait, it doesn't mean that you're not going to see the patterns because often you will. Um, and if you don't have any other resource, I know, I know a really successful, very good writer who learned from Sid Fields, just read the book and she's done one. Uh, and I'm saying I've analyzed the films for, for the class and they're like, terrific. So it's a tool that can help you. Uh, we were just taught in a different world where you're thinking about how it's affecting your audience. Um, and yes, we, Frank Daniels 
did the three act structure. <laughs> and I hear people say, well, Sid Field came up with the three act structure. There was actually a book that came out the year before screenplay that espoused the three act structure, but it just didn't catch on. I, I forget what it was called. But Frank Danielle in 79 had been talking about it for years. And of course, you can trace it. You can trace it to Aristotle. It's, it becomes explicit. There's a book called um, Playmaking by uh, Archer. I forget the guy's first name. It came out in 1912, I think. And he described essentially a three act structure. He said plays tend to be five acts, but they're really three, you know, set up, develop, and resolution. It's been around a while. But as I say, it's really, we, the way I approach it, it's a tool for getting us into this mode of um, hope and fear, which is what sustains our interest. And then you, you go from there. So if you want to use that tool, use it. You're right. And it's, 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 it's exactly what you're saying is like, if it works for the outcome that you're trying to achieve, then use it. If you want to use a hammer or if you want to use an iPhone to get that, that nail in the, into the wood while you're building the house, right. it's your choice. One tool probably will do it better than the other and is that less right. expensive. But whatever works for you that makes sense for you and what you're trying to achieve, you should use. I'm not sure if that analogy works or not. But Yeah, well, I mean, if you want to destroy your iPhone, then that's what you use. You use the iPhone. I mean, that's, I, that's, that's the way. <laughs> then you spare that hammer. You know, the hammer you save for other jobs. Right. Uh, but, Maybe a hammer or a wrench, let's say. A wrench. You could use a wrench yeah, to get it in as opposed to an, a hammer, but the hammer is – better prepared to, you know, better built to do some, that kind of job. So I think all these tools, all these methods, all these techniques that uh, all of these authors and gurus and, and just teachers from throughout history have thrown on us, that's exactly what they are. They're tools, they're techniques, and they put them in your toolbox and you bring them out to achieve the, what you achieve what you want to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's, uh, there's other tools too that I've, Talk about with the students that um, that I've noticed filmmakers use to keep us wondering what's going to happen next. And sometimes you can sustain a whole movie with them. Sometimes you really can't. You need the help of other tools. But uh, something like uh, what Frank Daniel used to call advertising. I don't like that term. I use telegraphing. Um, it's uh, essentially telling the audience literally where the film is going. Because a, a drama, unlike a a novel. Novel ha usually they're happened in the past. You've got a narrator that tells you what happened. Um, drama since Greek times was something that was about to happen right in front of you. Okay? Mm -hmm. They were all they've been written in the present tense. They're instructions for actors and that set people about what to do for something you're going to create right in front of you of the audience. And so it's particularly important to keep the audience attention into the future, anticipating. And so uh, you can have a something called an appointment. You've seen it used in movies, you know, uh, I'll meet you at Jerry's use at Terry at five o'clock, you know? And then because film is selective, you don't just turn the camera on and run it. You cut to different places. When you arrive at Jerry's use at you're not confused about that. You're not, you don't know, you know why you're there. So you, you maintain anticipation and also, uh, uh you're not uh, coherent. Um, another one that can be used is a deadline it's called a deadline or a ticking clock. You know, you've got five days to bring the Duke back, you know, by midnight Friday or you're, or I'm cooked, you know, mm -hmm. that's, you do that. And it's done in Toy Story. I mean, from the get go, these guys knew what they were doing. The original one, it's the birth, the move is in a week, right? So we know that we have one week to, that this story is going to take place in a week. And that helps us because we've all, I think, had the experience of being in a movie where you thought it was over and then it just keeps going. And it keeps going. And it keeps going. That, would be, that, that would be right. the end of Lords of Rings. Lords of the Rings. They yeah. had like eight <laughs> endings. And we're just like, are you kidding me, Peter? Come on. Let's move on. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I remember I had a friend, a bunch of us like were teenagers, went to the, to the opening of the first one, you know, to get together in the theater, a bunch of colleagues. And one of them had a, just before the movie started, he got one of these big gulp water, you know. <laughs> I said, it's you're like, not going to oh. make it. There's no intermission. <laughs> I was right. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, the, the problem is that the filmmaker hasn't signaled properly when the big moment is because we do emotionally save ourselves for these big moments. And so a deadline can help with that, that you put a framework around it. Uh, the one that I like to, example I like to give is, um, uh, what is that, American Beauty, where it starts out with a guy yeah. saying, in a year I'll be dead. 
Right. It's a, there's a deadline for you. You know, so what it does is it, it lets us, it lets the audience relax and not wonder where this is going. You don't want the audience wondering where it's going. You want them to be anticipating. So if you tell them where it's going, right. okay, let's get there. Yeah. And that's what it's like. So American Beauty is a great example. I love doing this with movies. I did it with my, my, my last movie I, I directed where I show a scene that's far from inside the movie, closer to the end at the very beginning to let everybody mm-hmm. know, oh, hell, this is going to we're, – we're in for a treat. And you're waiting for like you know either there's a meltdown or a murder or something happens. And you know it, it, it's not a surprise that there's a murder. We all know that someone's going to get killed. But we're like who did it? And when are we going to get to that point? And now, and now you're on the ride with them. So I love that technique. Uh, as well, that's, uh, as we a, just did uh, Sunset Boulevard with my students. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it's it's a great the, the player. I mean, if you remember the player, um, there's so many of those. That technique is so powerful. If you do it yeah. properly, you 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 show that that little bit of information at the beginning. You're like, what do you mean someone's gonna die? Like, and then all you're in. So now you're completely connected to these characters. You're like. When am I going to see the? When am I going to see the tiger come out? This is basically where we're, we've we've been informed that the tiger is there, and he killed right. somebody. And we're like, where is the tiger? When is this? Okay. When is the hammer going to drop? And I right. love that. I love uh, speaking of suspense because uh, again, I'm a huge Hitchcock Hitchcock fan, and I never I've never heard anyone express explain suspense better than Hitchcock, which is the the bomb underneath the, the under underneath the table. Right. Can you tell that story? Oh yeah, that's the idea. Is that you can sustain suspense longer than surprise? Just, the effect of surprise is fifteen seconds. I think, that, and suspense maybe fifteen minutes. And the difference would be that if you have two people sitting in a cafe talking, uh, and then a bomb blows up, okay, you had a shock effect. But if you um, reveal to the audience ahead of time that there's a bomb under the table then every line of dialogue is imbued with this dramatic irony and every line of dialogue has a double meaning i mean when somebody says do you think i should get another coffee well i'm not sure you know and tick 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 suddenly that innocuous line has a huge impact and that's another one of the tools is dramatic irony i have to let my students know, you know, the characters don't have to know everything all the time. You can, you know, reveal things and just not let them see certain things. Um, but what was the big rule? But, but what was the big rule that Hitchcock said that you cannot break when doing that technique? Do you remember? Oh, no. I, I, no tell me. So the technique of, of the suspense is he goes, he did it once in a movie and the audience was very, uh, very um, angry at him, which is you show them the bomb. And it's ticking, but under no circumstances can that bomb go off and kill the characters. You cannot uh, let that happen, he goes, because the audience will be very angry with you. If you kill them, actually, like, surprise, that's fine. But if you tell and you torture them for 15 minutes and then you still kill them, the, you lose the audience. And I was like, that's it's because he, he did it in one of his early movies. I forgot, it was a foreign uh, con- uh, correspondent or something like that, where there was a bomb on the, tr- on the bus. And we knew the bomb was on the bus and it was ticking and it blew up and everyone was like, no, 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 no. You can't. There's a contract. There's a contract. Yeah. We, we, we have an agreement here. You can't do something like that. So, I, you know, that's a rule that I, I haven't seen broken very often. I mean, in a suspenseful situation, you, in that specific scenario, you can't blow up the characters. You just can't. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I'll remember that because you know I happen to have a script right now that I'm working on where I killed those characters. I'm going to change that. Change right it right now. away. Mr. Hitchcock said no. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you a few questions because I, I could keep talking to you, Paul, for about another two or three hours. But I know you're a busy man. You've got oh. fresh minds. You have fresh minds to teach. Uh, so I want oh, to. But I want to say one more thing about yeah. the deadline thing. There mm-hmm. are a couple of movies that they do. That you, I've seen that sustain the audience interest in those primarily through that purpose, through that means. One of them was the Hurt Locker. You know, that's a, that's a huge, I don't know if you saw that, mm-hmm, but it's a countdown. So the, the screenwriter there, is, he seems to be able to write these micro-realistic scenes, very vivid, um, but it, it freed him to just explore these different situations. As long as we're reminded once in a while that, that we're kicking down to day zero, then we know it's going somewhere. So we like, high, like high noon. Like High Noon, eventually, yeah. High Noon is another one. 
Um, 500 days of summer didn't go exactly uh, mm-hmm. in order, but eventually, when you, you know that when you get to 499, the movie's almost over. You know, or <laughs> Julia and Juliet. You know, there was a yeah. different recipe every day. When you get to recipe 350, we're we're close to being at the end. So you can do that to frame things, and then it frees you to to explore other kinds of drama. Anyway, okay, and, 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 it, and, and it's and it's a and it's a kind of roadmap for the audience, like. At the end, yeah. it, it like at twelve o'clock, all hell's gonna break loose. At three hundred and sixty-five recipes, we're pretty much gonna yeah. be close to the end of this thing. So it's kind we of better get the chocolate cake by that point, you know, the really rich frosting. But perfect. <laughs> so, per, so perfect example with Julia and Julia, which I love that movie, by the way. Imagine if you've made that agreement with the audience at the beginning, and at the at the at the, at the day three sixty-five, she's like, you know, there's another book I'm gonna do, and you go on another, and like, and that's like. Right. And you just start, she's just like, you know what? I want to do another blog and I'm just going to, and that's, and the movie keeps going. Can you imagine that movie would be horrible? You'd be like, no, 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 no. We, there was an agreement here. Yeah. You can you, break that, you can break that agreement here and there, but you've got to be careful with how you do it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's, but I, I, I was just thinking of how horrible that movie would be. After, <laughs> like, let's say high noon. At noon, they're like, nah, four o'clock. We're just, nah, we're, they're, they're, they're a little bit late, right? Let's, <laughs> we're, we we did a shootout here, but there's three other guys coming at four, so we're just gonna keep going. Like you can't, right. <laughs> you can't right. especially and if the movie. Promise. You got to keep that promise, or people will, will turn on you and without that, question. So I'm gonna ask you a few a few questions. I, I ask all my guests, and one specific to you uh, that I've never asked before on the show, and I want to. I'm gonna start asking all of my guests. What are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Three. Screenplay that every screenwriter should read. Boy, um, that's you know what I'm. I so closely identify the screenplay with the movie, but mm-hmm. you know the style of like uh, Bill, I, I consider Billy Wilder like the guy who could. He, yeah. any, any of his movies is like a textbook on mm-hmm. how to write a screenplay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the screenplays that he was writing were done. They were called continuities. And their style was very different. Um, or Preston Sturges. If you, oh, I love Preston, Preston Sturges. Sturges. Yeah, if you're going to read a screenplay and really enjoy it, any of the Preston Sturges comedies from the early 40s will get you there. And Sull- Sullivan's be- Travels. Yeah. Oh, Sullivan's Travels. Yeah. Oh, so good. Right. But just be prepared that it's not going to be in the master sequence, uh, master scene format. It's going to be in the continuity with the sequences uh, marked, you know, sequences A through whatever they were doing. Um, okay, the screenplays that I've loved, <laughs> there's a, one screenplay, one of my favorite movies, um, is called Trouble in Paradise. Mm-hmm. I it remember was, that movie. 1932, the first talky romantic comedy, and arguably still the best one. <laughs> and it's in, uh, it's in a book called Three Screen Comedies by Samson Rayfieldson. So you can actually get that book and read that. And I, happened to read that script before um, I saw the movie because the movie was, this is when I was young, you know, we didn't have VHS. We couldn't get the movie. It was tied up somewhere. So I had to read exactly. the script. But, but that script was so, you got to see this, students, any student of film should see this movie. Um, it's, it was one of these, and it's, this is one of my pet peeves about a lot of films I see nowadays. It's about how the third act is like, usually too predictable because there's a misunderstanding of what the third act is, but that's another podcast. But mm-hmm. in this one, for example, what I, is that I'm reading this and I'm turning the pages of this comedy and I have no idea how they're going to solve this problem. That's I mean, the best. everything is, yeah, it's oh, like it's all the these best. different elements are coming into play. It's like, no, there is no way for this guy to get out of here. You know, it's not even, can he run faster or jump higher? It's like running faster, jumping. That's not going to even help him here. He's like trapped. Anyway, so that's Rayfieldson's, one of Rayfieldson's, uh, Billy Wilder, um, Double Indemnity is a terrific one because you can learn about indirection in the dialogue, you know, what a lot of people call subtext. I use a slightly different term, but uh, speak, how act, the characters are speaking metaphorically so they don't have to reveal what they're really talking is about. There, is there any movies in the last, uh, let's say, 20 years, in the 2000s, that, that, that screenplay you're like, man, you've got to read this? I don't know if I've I've seen some good, obviously some really good movies, but I the scripts I've read, 
Now, a recent movie that I, not maybe recent anymore, um, which kind of breaks the rules a little bit is In Bruges. Um, yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> and I like to show that after I show a classic, like Toy Story. I mean, I've read the script. It's a great script to read, but it's, I think it's a conforming script. It's one that they wrote after they, you know, animation is a little different. They, yeah. When they get to the end, then they write the script that is that maybe the you know the stars are going to actually read because mm-hmm. it's synced up to that thing. But that's all right. That's twenty four years ago now. It's not within the. Yeah, that's good. fair enough. Fair um, enough. You know, I don't want to put but, you on the spot. It's fine. But but I've read no. The in Bruges is very literate. I liked it. Um, but he, I, I'd say the script was flawed compared to the movie because the. the end, it's always script, interesting. It's always interesting. Sometimes the script is so much better than the movie, and sometimes the movie is so much better than the script. Right. He definitely cut some things out of there. Just like, well, everybody does. I mean, I don't even know if you know if you know Sunset Boulevard. There was an opening there that was cut out. Wow. Because it cut out Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, it starts out in a morgue with him talking to the other dead bodies. I'll explain, well, how'd you get here? Well, I'll tell you my story. And when they test screened it, they shot it. When they test screened it, they found out that people were laughing too hard, and then they didn't know how to take the rest of the movie. They thought it was straight-up comedy. Well, I mean, so it's they, a, that, yeah, two, a body talking to other bodies. I mean, yeah, I mean... Right. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? So that, you can read the script. I, I think... No, I never read... I never got to read that version of the script. But anyway, uh, in Bruges is very literate. Uh, that, that's a good script to read, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, that's so, plenty of good ones. That's that's plenty uh, of that's plenty of homework for everybody. Okay. <laughs> now, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Yeah, well, that is um, probably going to sound familiar to you and the other guests. But obviously, reading screenplays, I've you asked about reading screenplays. I haven't read that many lately, but when I was when I was younger, when I was learning, that's what you do. You have to read the screenplays and find out how they read and what you know how things are expressed. So you read a lot of those, and then um, you write them, and you just keep writing. And I am the of the uh, persuasion that you write what you're really passionate about without concern about marketability. I mean, yes, you want it to connect with people. But um, the, there's uh, another um, uh, teacher I've heard interviewed uh, named, let's see, it's, uh, he talks about the, the pitch-perfect authentic script. That's the term he uses. I think it's a great term. The, the pitch-perfect authentic script. That's the one that's very unique, that, the, the, that is really your original voice that connects with people. That don't be afraid of that. You know, write the things that are really exciting to you. Um, and uh, so doing that. And then, this again, the seam and history that's opened up, you're talking about, I'm encouraging the screenwriters to, to take initiative and make their stuff. You know, make Fair it. Enough. Yeah. And nowadays, and, you can definitely have the power to do so. You, If you wanted to do it in 1965, you had to shoot 16 millimeter black and white, sync sound, and pray. And now you could shoot something that they can't really tell isn't done with a million bucks. And you make it look good. Now you can, don't worry about the gatekeepers, do it. And you are going to learn. And I'm doing a class now, experimental class, where the students were all writing uh, quibbies. You know, the quibby thing with five to, we're doing five to seven minutes, they're doing seven to 15 minutes. But each student writes seven minutes of a, of a continuing story that we're trying to hook the audience in. And then we shoot it in January and see if it plays, you know, and get them. My, my hope is that eventually develop it in a way that students leave film school with a credit on something that people maybe have seen, you know, wow. there's no reason you yeah. can right now. The model of film school is make a short film, send it to festivals and pray mm-hmm. because there's never been, there hasn't been a market for short films in a hundred years. It went out in the teens when we went into features and serials. The original serials were actually what we call quibbies now. They're about 15, 20 minute episodes. And that's what we're going to, we're going back to that. All so right. They can go, they can do that and have something marketable. Anyway, that, that's a suggestion would be if you're not in film school, you could still do these things. And, and I think it, it get recognized that way and draw attention to yourself. And I do think there's great many opportunities now that than there ever was. So. Uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? 
Oh, okay. So I'm giving that some thought. Um, the uh, without trying to sound mysterious, it's understanding that you can you can be living two lives: the one you think you're living and the one you're in. <laughs> you know that you <laughs> that very you much. Can, sometimes you you learn this lesson that something you thought you knew you didn't really know, and that it, you have to reassess how you how you understand things. And no. that's yeah. perfect. Now, what did you uh, learn from your biggest failure? Learn from my biggest... Oh, I'd like to tell you. <laughs> I've had plenty of those. So, I, I mean, this is a rich experience you're talking about. <laughs> Fair. Same but here, sir. I, I like... Well, you've, you've heard of the Duke of Wellington, the guy that yeah. beat Napoleon. He has a quote that I, I, I like to use frequently. It's, uh, he wasn't always a winner. He had this disastrous campaign in Spain a few years before. Uh, he beat Napoleon at Waterloo. And he, he commented on it. He said, well, I learned what not to do, and that's always something. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, the biggest lesson that I've learned from, a, you said, from a failure? Yeah, what's the, what, 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 uh, what did you learn from your biggest failure? I learned from my biggest failure. Um, to, I guess the biggest thing would be to relax and focus on what you really want to make and, and, and do that, you know, cause I, I remember the experience was that out of film school, I developed a thesis screenplay, you know, and it actually got recognition and it got me a, a William Morris agent. And I was like, this is really great. I'm on my way. But then when that didn't sell, you know, he was, it was like, Hey, what's the next project? And suddenly I was in a different world because I felt like they were watching me like, and I was being, I was trying to create under these circumstances of desperately, you know, and it changed my process. I didn't know enough to just say, whatever, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and you'll like it or not. So that, that was a, a failure. That was an opportunity that was missed. And it was because that. Now, what was the, what was the fear that you had to overcome to write your first screenplay? What was that big fear that you had to overcome? Oh, the biggest fear to overcome when I was writing that first screenplay, uh, I suppose whether I had enough story. You know, remember I was under the guidance of a master mm -hmm. screenwriter who is, you know, fact, I was not only a teacher, he did uh, produce and write a lot of films in Czechoslovakia and won Academy Award for Shop on Main Street 1965 mm -hmm. as a producer in that case. So he actually knew uh, the process inside and outside. Um, so I had that, that, uh, um, guide, but still when I'm just, when you're just trying to, when I was just trying to get ideas together about how I'm going to do this, you know, what, is there enough story there? I suppose that, that might've been it. Okay. So. And, uh, three of your favorite films of all time. That one, you know, that, that kind of changes. Depends Every on day. what age I am, what it, but I would certainly put, uh, uh, Trouble in Paradise uh, up there. Uh, if it, uh, Defining it as a movie, yeah, put it on. I'll watch it again. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that kind of mm -hmm. movie. Um, I certainly, what else? I, um, man, there's so many amazing ones. Um, I did, I really think, from the point of view of pure craftsmanship, the first Toy Story is, is a remarkable accomplishment. I was actually mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a invited to give a, 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 a lecture at, at Disney Animation a little while ago. And nice. guess what? I used that movie. I said, I don't know what process they used to, to work this, but here I'm going to show you what they were doing. Uh, and it's just in 80 minutes, you know, the stuff that they did. Um, what else have I? I mean, I love Lawrence of Arabia. That's another uh, textbook of, of cinema, text. of cinema in general. Of cinema, period. Um, I guess that dates me with a little older films, but um, that's, uh, that's those are probably those are three. Those are three good ones. Yeah. Those are three good ones. They've been on the show before, so it's uh, except for Trouble in Paradise. I think it's the first time that's been on the show. So, uh, but you have very good choices. Well, that one, I got to tell you, Trouble in Paradise, written by a guy named Samson Rayfieldson. I had a chance when I was in college to take a class with him. <laughs> Believe oh, it or wow. not. He was 80, he was 80 years old when he was teaching that class. He would come in with his wife. He was hard of hearing, you know, and he, she would help him a little bit. And he, the first class he told us, 
um, don't uh, think that you're going to you know get any industry contacts from me because everyone I know is dead. <laughs> 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 great line. Oh, that's great line. Right. I plan to so use. I, I plan to connection. use. I plan to use that in about forty years, uh, forty or fifty okay. years. <laughs> okay. I must save that one. <laughs> now, right, where well, w- where can people find yeah. you and uh, find out about your work and the books you've written? Well, I the first book I had, which seems to have it's had legs, it came out fifteen years ago, but it's called uh, Screenwriting: The Sequence Approach, okay. and we haven't talked much about that, but it's a uh, a technique that I learned from Frank Danielle. Uh, that one is available. Um, then the new one is called The Science of Screenwriting uh, by uh, Connie Shears and me. Um, and then uh, my um, website is called rightsequence.com. Okay. Uh, and all one word, and it, that's if, you know, for if people want to learn more. So Paul, that. it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, my friend. Thank you so much. You have dropped Thanks. multiple knowledge bombs today, sir. <laughs> okay, those knowledge bombs are coming, but they're peaceful, right? They're positive bombs. They're you know positive they're bombs. They're very positive, yeah. good information bombs. So thanks again for being on the show, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Paul, for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs on the tribe. If you want to get any of Paul's books or get in contact with Paul, You can get his information in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS057. And if you haven't already, please head over to ScreenwritingPodcast.com. Subscribe and leave us a good review. It really helps the show out a lot. And as you can hear, my voice is a little bit hoarse today because of all the talking I've been doing at AFM. And if you guys are going to be at AFM, I will be there uh, probably Monday and definitely Tuesday doing my talk at 2.30 on micro-budget filmmaking. So I hope to see you guys there. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 